السلام عليكم يا شباب كيف الحال شو اخباركم؟ طبعا حلقه جديده في الكهف الاسود اللي في بيتنا مع نابغه من نوابغ عالم الانابوليكس عندنا اليوم فيكتور بلاك فيكتور بلاك وايد نتكلم عنه انا ودكتور حتى في نقاشاتنا عن انابوليكس دوم نطري اسمه نطري اسم رودريك نطري اسم جون جوت نطري اسم هالاعلام اللي موجوده في اللي اللي وضحوا لنا شوي موضوع انابوليكس بشكل افضل وساينس بيست وحتى يعني على ارض الواقع تطبيقه وايد اسهل واحسن وفي لونجفيتي في استمراريه كبيره بطريقه مش امنه طريقه امن طبعا اليوم عندنا ضيف من تايلند اللي هو فيكتور فيكتور وفيكتور طبعا في البدايه دوم يقول سوادي كاب بالتايلندي لان عايش في تايلند بس الحين بيقول شيء ثاني جو هيد فيكتور ثانك يو فيري ماتش So are you, are you guys want to want to lead us off today? I'm I'm all ears. We can take this conversation wherever you, wherever you guys would like to take. Just yeah. whatever you like, Victor. You would we'd like to start with an EBM, evidence based medicine. We'll go with the flow. Yeah, we would we'll go, go with, the, with we flow. would go with the flow. And then if you want to bring up the topics that you talked about, science based and stuff, yeah, we we we're definitely we're down. Yeah, that. yeah. So, salam alaykum first. Yeah, just salam alaykum first, Victor. Salam alaykum. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so one of the uh, the topics I want to broach today was the idea of evidence-based education, which I think is incredibly pertinent, specifically because of your background as a, as a physician. Yeah. So most people would accept the idea that if you were suffering a disease state, regardless of where you lived in the world, if you, if you visited a world-class specialist, uh, On in oncology, really any disease state, it doesn't matter what we're talking about, regardless of whether they were Dubai-based or in Bangkok or, or London or New York, most people would go into that you know, experience with an expectation that it doesn't matter what specialist you visit, that they will have a consultation and, and a diagnosis and a treatment plan would be put forward, which was common amongst you know, a, a, a hundred specialists, yeah? One of the greatest frustrations that I experienced when I was coming through the ranks was you used to ask 10 different people the same question, and I'm not joking, you would get 10 different answers. Yeah. yeah, And it was incredibly frustrating because you didn't know who to trust and who to speak to. Now, what I truly believe is that we're going through a revolution. It's been happening in the natural community for almost 20 years now. There's dozens of what I call evidence-based educators really you know, credible voices. I don't, I don't know whether you guys, guys know names like Dr. Scott Stevenson and, uh, you know, guys like uh, Eric Helms, Dr. Yes. Eric Helms, Dr. Brad Schofer. There's dozens. I don't want to leave guys' names off. There's dozens of them. Bill Campbell. They've, they've, they've brought forth our understanding of training practices a long way. Now, that doesn't mean they necessarily invented things. What they did for the most part was they looked at what bodybuilders were doing and, and, and run applied science studies and said, look, if you look at option A and option B, plausibly option B might be a little bit better. That's really what they did, yeah? They, they ended a lot of bro science discussions. So, so I would argue that in the natural bodybuilding world, the understanding of what evidence-based practice or evidence-based education is well understood, Yeah. That doesn't mean that it's ended all discussions. Before the call, we were talking about this idea of, you know, the training, you know, the training volume debate, the the the, the volume versus intent. I mean, it's just even now it's it goes on and on and on and on. And 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 what I wanted to talk about today was the underlying reasons behind why that happens. Because unless you understand the challenges of education in our tribe, it's very hard to know who to listen to or what questions to ask. Yeah. So the first premise I would say is that it's important to understand that even back in the day when we used to read magazines and that's how we got information pre-internet, the business model of the big magazines was a subscription based. And what that meant was they wanted you to buy the magazine every month to read the latest articles. But the challenge was for anyone that was a, a religious subscriber like me, you would read an article in May And then you would read an article in June and they literally said the completely opposite things to each other. And then in September, they went back to the first one. Now, the reason <laughs> they did that, they weren't really interested in education. They were interested in subscription. And what this tribe just doesn't really understand is that this is not a united tribe. This is a tribe with different subgroups mm -hmm. and each of the subgroups has a, an agenda. And that's fine. That's not a criticism. It's just a reality. 
So I came up as a user. I wasn't an educator and I wasn't a coach. I was a user. So what I wanted was plausibly different from what the magazines wanted. Yeah. I just wanted someone to sit down and explain to me what I need to do so I can just get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> like that's all I wanted was the answers. Right. But like, if you understand how YouTubers work, they need to keep creating new content. They need to keep saying things. Mm. The moment they stop talking, their revenue falls away. Yeah. Whereas someone that sells a thousand dollar coaching course like John Dewitt can educate you within a block of time and, and you can move on with your day. He doesn't need to keep you attached because the revenue stream is immediate for him. So the difference between a YouTuber and John is what you can expect as an educational package is vastly different. One is a concise set of answers. And one is I need to string you along as long as possible. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. And people don't understand like the volume, you know, intensity debate or weight on the bar debate, however you want to, you know, you know, phrase it is driven by individuals that have no vested interest in the argument ending. In fact, quite the opposite of true is their vested interest is it keeps going on and on and on because they don't want to lose your eyeballs. Yeah. And so this is something, unless you understand the needs of the splinter groups, the needs of coaches is different to the needs of the user community. The needs of the educators who educate the coaches is different to the needs of the coaches. The needs of the YouTubers, they, they all have different needs. That's not a criticism. It's just an honest observation. It's, mm -hmm. it's a fact. Yeah. And when I say needs, it's for the most part financial. Financial talking person. about how, how people generate revenue. This is one of the, the challenges that I constantly face where people keep you know pushing on me about why I desire recognition and why I desire the brand black to be attached with my education. Quite bluntly, it's this, and that is this for me is legacy and it's a business. I, I'm not a charity, I don't teach other charities. The people I teach are uh, are coaches that charge five hundred dollars a month for what they do. But, but people want to take my content and treat me like a charity. And so you have to understand that ultimately cannot end anywhere but in conflict because you need to consider my needs in the process. Yeah. So I guess I wanted to talk about what evidence-based education means and why I specifically use the claim that I'm the world's only evidence-based educator. I understand that's, that sounds incredibly arrogant until you understand what I mean. And then most people are going, oh, okay, well, that's, that's a... So what I would argue, there's three tiers to evidence-based education. There is what the clinical or sports literature says. What's this, what does the science say? But anyone that thinks that evidence-based education is only about clinical literature doesn't understand what we're talking about. What holds equal weight in this conversation is observation and experience, 50 years of doing, yeah? You cannot only lean into one of those vectors. You cannot, yeah? And then there's the vector of personal choice or what I call client preference and how you arrive at a determination for the right outcome for any individual is you, gotta, you have to balance all three. You have to. So here, here's the first criteria. If you can just consider the drugs testosterone, insulin, and growth hormone, these are some of the most studied drugs in all pharmacology. There are thousands of things. You could immerse yourself in that literature for life, never come outside that scope, and never read everything there is to read on those drugs. Yeah, right. the, the, the depth of the body of literature we have to consider on pharmacology is so vast, yeah, that I'm not joking when I say I don't know that you could consume it yourself in 10 years. And so what most people end up doing is they're looking for a way to short circuit that process, which means I will listen to someone else's opinion and parrot that. Now, I am incredibly empathetic because it's 10 years of work, right? And even then, you have to understand, so if you're a bodybuilder, and you're a coach, and you're immersed in the literature, who has time? So just do you really understand the literature or did you read someone's interpretation of the literature? 
disqualifies you as an, if you haven't immersed yourself in literature, you cannot consider yourself evidence-based educator. Mm -hmm. You can consider yourself an evidence-based coach, but someone has educated you. You didn't come to your own conclusions. Now, let's talk about observation. This tribe is about 50 years old, approximately. Back to, you know, Arnold kicked everything off, like awareness. Like it, it literally, in Arnold's day, there was one of the Mr. Olympus he won. He was the only man on stage. You understand what I'm saying? Like that's where it all started. And then there was one, there was two men and then there was, there was three men, right? So in Pumping Iron, there was three competitors in the over 200 class. And this is what I'm saying is, yes, it predates that, but that's really the start point about 50 years ago. I've been watching for 40 years. I have observational insight that dates back 40 years. Someone that's been doing this for three years how can you possibly say that you have insight into observation after three years of doing? It's not possible. I mean, I want to talk to someone at the end of their career. They, they were a medical doctor. They went through medical school. They practiced for 20 years in their specialty field. Now I want to know what you learned from clinical experience, not in year two of medical school. You just don't know. <laughs> True. <laughs> just don't, right? But where we're cursed in this tribe is we are a tribe of 25-year-old men. How do you fulfill those criteria at 25? It's physically impossible. Right. True. You have, on one hand, limited experience and observation. That's not a criticism. It's simple fact. Mm, reality. And then how could you possibly have spent 10,000 hours immersed in the clinical literature at your age? It's not possible. I didn't start speaking for 32 years. The reason I am an evidence-based educator, when I speak, I started speaking eight years ago. I never mm. spoke before that. The day I opened my mouth, you were hearing 32 years of observation and learning. Yeah, Guys aren't even 32 years old and they're talking. right? So when you use that criteria, say, so what benchmark do you mean? If you've been doing this for three or four years, you simply don't qualify. Yeah. And then what you have to understand is this. So then there's the third criteria of working with others, not just yourself. Mm. And the great challenge in this space is working with the genetically elite is vastly different than working with Citizen Joe. But what people don't understand is how rare the genetically elite are. There are 450 players in the NBA. Those players come from all over the world. And there's only 450 of them. Of those 450, there's 50 freaks. So what is the likelihood of the typical average coach ever working with a contender? Very small. Very small, true. Very small. Most people don't get to work with you. So how do you gain insight and experience about how the elite respond versus the average? You just cannot. Yeah. And so these are the problems is when you start to put these things on the table, you go, no, it's just the bar that you need to get over to say that you have enough experience to say, I qualify as an evidence-based educator. That bar excludes all but a small handful of people. Yeah, it just does when you think about it. Most people that are speaking are 25 years old. How can they be speaking yet? Yeah, and then there's a, a criteria that falls on top of that. I truly believe that you do not qualify as an evidence-based educator unless you allow people to critically review your claims. Unless you're prepared to submit what you say to peer review, you disqualify yourself from that conversation. Right. I have a standing offer. Anyone can critically review anything I've ever said in the last eight years. Why am I so brazen? Because I learned for 32 years before I opened my mouth. I made every mistake you could ever make. And some of them I made more than once, but I made them before I started talking. So when you start thinking about like going like these are reasonable things like how can you be talking at 25 like you just if you were my son you would be starting your PE journey at 25 mm -hmm. not educating people on how they should do it I want to listen to guys that have been doing this for 20 years that's who I want to hear and then I want those guys to be willing to let me ask them questions mm -hmm. 
And if they're not prepared to answer my questions in a robust way, it's not an insult when I ask you, when I challenge you, when I say what evidence you're basing on, you cannot be offended. You have to say, I welcome this discussion. I'm the only person in the PD education world that lets people ask me questions. Everybody else gets upset or offended. You know, how is that possible? And then here's the final challenge. All that does is buys you a seat at the table. Right. All of that knowledge, it doesn't mean anything beyond, okay, you get to sit down next to me and, let, let, and now let's start talking about what your opinion is versus my opinion. It doesn't make you God. It simply means that you have the right to speak. And what I've been proposing for years is there should be a, a council of elders almost within this tribe where we have 10 men that get together and discuss these things, and the wisdom of these 10 men is passed down to the tribe. Right. This is how things have always been in the history of mankind. Like like setting a guideline, Victor, right? You would say, That's hey. how it's always worked in every endeavor in history. The wise men of the tribe set the rules that the tribe live by. Yeah? And it's not one man, it's the wisdom of the tribe, but you don't have 13-year-old boys sitting at the tribal <laughs> council. That's just not how it happens. You understand but what I mean? You know, Victor, the, the, I think maybe financial is going to be a problem for someone. I mean, like to have a standard guideline for everybody, right? No, I disagree. What I mean by that is this. I have been eating the same way for 30 years. Nothing right. has changed. I have been training the same way for 30 years. People have been using the same drug models for 30 years. The only thing that's changed in bodybuilding in the last 30 years, the only mm -hmm. conversation of any interest is the discussion around harm reduction. Right. Harm if you go yeah. back and look at Dorian Yates's drug model and you simplify it under the black models, it's no different to what we're doing today. It's this many androgens, as much growth hormone as you can afford, and maybe you lean into insulin and maybe you don't. Mm. That's the drug model. Right. Right. It hasn't changed. Now, there are lots of nuances that you could argue but there's all the room in the world for nuances because they usually come down to personal preference. Mm. Right? I'll give you a simple example. There's debates like Prima Bolin is not a, a strong enough androgen for bodybuilders. You hear this all the time, but you only have to have been training for as long as I have. You have to understand Arnold Schwarzenegger led in, leaned, leaned into Diana Bolin, Prima Bolin. No one really disputes that. Mm. Yeah, And because who he was who he was, it's very much like when Dorian Yates was on top, everybody wanted to do HIT, right? That's just how it works, yeah? Right. When Arnold was Arnold, everybody was using Prima Bolin. Mm. There, was, there was no discussion about it being a weak steroid, but you know, influence changes and opinion changes, but you have to go, how is it possible that men in the 70s leveraged drugs like prima bolin to such outcomes and yet it's not powerful enough for your average gym rat today that doesn't make any sense <laughs> true logically that just doesn't make any sense it what has changed is influence has changed and people's cognitive bias has changed not the evidence yeah so the, 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 i guess I don't want. I want to. I want to spend some time talking about drugs and answering questions about drugs. But the first thing I would I would challenge people to understand is, unless you understand the intent and the agenda and the needs of the people speaking, you run the risk of wasting your time listening to them, mm. because you have to understand that a great many. You understand, like, and, I, and I, I, I won't name names, but there are people saying Mastron doesn't work. There are people saying Prima Bolin doesn't work. There are people saying Anavar's too weak. Let's just say you listen to those three people. What logically you get to then is the question of, well, what am I going to use? It's a fair question, right? Right. You've eliminated three of the the three of the five drugs that are, are really lifetime candidates. Simply simply based not on quality evidence, but the opinion of an individual based on his personal choice. Mm. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that personal choice isn't valid. For example, I've just never understood Anavar. I've tried Anavar, but it doesn't speak to me. But for me to say it doesn't work or it's not a suitable drug is just incredibly disrespectful to the evidence and historical users. Guys like Dorian Yates 
use Danova. Mm -hmm. Just because it doesn't speak to me doesn't give me the right to tell people it doesn't work. That's right. ridiculous. Right? Yeah, right. And, and one of the greatest challenges with education is we confuse people's personal choice in that triad as being the evidence. Mm -hmm. And this is part of, if you know the black models, in first exposure, in black first exposure, the first thing I suggest we do is introduce you to Nangelo, Mastron, Prima Bowl, and Anabar, and we ask the question, does one of those drugs speak to you? Because we need to create a lifetime framework as well as a, an acute framework because we can't blast crews for 30 years. It's just not practical. True. Yeah? So, so the question is, we're going to use testosterone. That's a given. It's pretty easy to defend that statement. And then what's our secondary engine going to be? I would argue it needs to be one that quote unquote works and it needs to be as benign as possible. I mean, halotestin excludes itself because of its toxicity profile. Mm -hmm. you, you understand that. And so the most benign drugs are Nandalone, Anabar, Primabolin, and Mastron, but you try them so you can make a personal determination about does one of them speak to you or not. Right. If you say Anavar is my drug of choice, I will go, great. If you say Mastron, I will go, great. If you say Primabolin, but if, if, you, if this guy says Primabolin doesn't work, and this guy says, you know, Mastron doesn't work, but this guy says, oh, I mean, you end up with this situation where nobody knows what to do next. Mm -hmm. And so the point of evidence-based education is you have to understand that very few people qualify because of lack of experience. And that's not a criticism. Imagine how much time it takes to fulfill the criteria. You're a bodybuilder and you're a coach and you're trying to educate yourself on the clinical literature and you're trying to understand 50 years of our historical practice and you're trying to assimilate the 100 clients that you've worked with and understand individual it's that's such an overwhelming task that you have to allocate probably at least 10 years to achieve that mm. minimum yeah so what, what do you call these people victor so what do you call those people? Like they they spend like three, four years experience, but they learn from you. They learn from John, like coaches, but not educator, right? I th I think what I th I think what they should focus on is is coaching, right? There's no reason you can't coach in a shorter time frame. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is I don't think you can educate coaches, right? Yeah. So if someone came to me and said, "Look, I only have three years of exposure in the game." but I know your model's inside out and I was to ask them some pertinent questions and they responded, I would go, great, have at it. But, you know, coming up with your own frameworks, I just don't think you have the experience yet. That's not unreasonable in my opinion. Like I said, if a, a, a third year medical student was, you know, trying to develop his own surgery techniques, you might say, listen, may maybe you should just be a surgeon first for a little bit. <laughs> rather than try to invent new ways of uh you're in yeah you know what i'm saying like that's a little bit arrogant and a little bit ambitious i have absolutely no problem with someone going through say john jewett's course because i honestly think it's the number one educational platform for coaches in the world today it's hard to argue who else right, right? so pay the man the thousand dollars go through the course learn what he teaches you and then go and get a roster of clients and teach them that that's how it works. And then 10 years later, you have probably gained enough experience that you might want to add, you know, something to the table. And I all is, but that's not, not how the dialogue is happening today. Because I have guys who are 23 years old wanting to argue with 40 years of experience. And the moment that I ask them questions like, what evidence are you basing that on? They get angry at me rather than concede the point and listen. Right. Yeah. So with that understanding, let's talk about drugs because I'm sure your audience would like to talk about. Yeah, yeah. They've sent us a lot of questions too. Let, let, let's start off with the topic that you've been posting recently, uh, Victor, which is anabolic androgenic uh, drugs, uh, milligram to milligram are the same. So I kind of know the answer, but I just want to know it uh, coming out from you. It's going to be a full uh, answer, I'm sure. So when you say a milligram to milligram for every steroid is the same, then why are we choosing different compounds? So what I would argue is that you have to understand the history of anabolic steroids. What, 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 what job do they fulfill? 
all of the drugs that were brought to market to deliver the therapeutic benefits of testosterone to the androgen sensitive, fundamentally, that's what they do. They deliver the therapeutic benefits of testosterone, but at lower androgenic impact. Now, the number one way that they do that is they are inhibited into DHT amplification. They're immune to amplification. So when you have a drug that is physically incapable of being amplified into DHT, by definition, it's less androgenic potentially than testosterone. And we have a number of drugs that were developed by different pharmaceutical companies designed to solve exactly that problem. But you need to see this through the filter that says, so this pharmaceutical company offered this drug and this pharmaceutical company offered that drug and this pharmaceutical offered that drug. So they're effectively competitive offerings from different commercial entities to solve the same problem. And when you understand it through that filter, you would go, well, why do we see them so vastly differently? They are literally competitors to each other. Now, so then the argument says, well, in that setting, what we would say is these drugs represent the therapeutic benefits of testosterone. They all accrete protein tissue in the same way that testosterone does. Yeah. But it's what else they do. It's the other things they do that determines which one of them we would use under certain certain conditions and why and how much. A, a simple example would be this. Anivar is commonly available as an oral compound, and that made administration easier for a lot of people. Right. Masteron has, I mean, it's been uh, evaluated by the developers in oral form, but it's always traditionally been an injectable compound. Yeah. So the difference between the oral administration pathway and the injectable changes client adherence. We know this. This is just how medication works. right? So the fact that it's in an oral format means in certain circumstances that just might lead to greater patient adherence. But in our tribe, where we're used to injecting multiple times a day, it's a somewhat mute discussion. Yeah. So what I would say is all DHT derivatives have the things that things in common they're designed to provide the therapeutic benefits of testosterone at lower androgenic impact they don't aromatize into estrogen and they don't amplify into dht so this is why you would rotate them all and see whether there's enough of a point of a difference that it might interest you mm -hmm. for me i just happen to like masteron but i know plenty of people that prefer prima bowl and but the magnitude or the delta of difference between the two is kind of marginal. Like, it's not that they're the same drug, but they're so chemically similar to each other that it's disingenuous to say they're a world away from each other. They're competitors. Mm. So try them both and tell me, literally, my question is, does one of them speak to you? Nine times out of 10, people will say yes. And then you lean into that. The idea that, you know, we have a drug like Masteron that was evaluated by the developers as a cattle growth promoter, extensively tested, and then patented as a cattle growth promoter, doesn't work as a growth promoter, is outrageous. Like, what an outrageous statement to make. Re in reality, what you'll find is what, how, how we arrived at that point is some people preferred Prima Bolin. Some people preferred Anavar, and right. there's nothing wrong with that statement. That's a completely defensible statement. But the idea that you have a drug that was patented by the developers as a growth promoter designed to compete with Trembolone, and it did a fabulous job. And the, the fact that people are walking around saying it doesn't work as a growth promoter, that's not a supportable statement in any way. You're mm -hmm. representing cognitive bias by, by displaying preference over evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, Victor... Right now, the thing is, from like and some some of the anecdotal evidence, I'm not pretty sure. I don't want to say my experience, but I found that people like using Masteron, for some reason, they do have lower estrogen level. Like it works as a better anti-estrogenic effect, right? And at the same time, maybe because of the lower estrogen level, it decreases your HDL more than Primobolin. Like the comparison between them. I don't know what what's what's your point in that, Victor. I, I, what I, what I would argue is in order to make a statement about something, you literally have to read all of the evidence we have on a subject. Right. And then you have to look at 50 years of doing 
And then you have to look at 100 genetically unique individuals to make an outcome statement, right? Now, when you average them all out together, it's, that's, not, that's not a very supportable statement. Yeah. There are outliers and there are individuals where you see profound effects, magnitude large enough to make it very clear we're going in this direction. Mm. Yeah, but just understand that, for example, the aromatase substrate pool is a finite thing. Mm -hmm. And it varies massively from individual to individual. Right. And, and it changes with things like age. Mm -hmm. Every single you know, aromatase impact study we have that looks at dose, there's a dose response. Yeah. So as you raise the dose of aromatase, aromatase, aromatizable compounds, the, the, the ratio of androgens to estrogen lowers. It's not a finite substrate. It's a, sorry, it is not an infinite substrate, Paul. It's finite. Does it make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then age changes that. Right. I see. And then what I would argue is so does this and so does that and so does your IGF-1 levels. And so what you have is this situation of you need to try it and see how you respond as a genetically unique individual and make a personal choice after you have tried it, rather than someone making blanket statements that cannot be supported in evidence. Right. That's why, Victor, yeah, please. Sorry. Your, your experience is going to be different to mine, right. but it's not because the drug works in some weird way. It's because of your genetics and mm -hmm. your environment that we introduce the drug to that we see different outcomes as I said, I, i'm not sure what do you think that your audience will understand that the aromatase substrate pool is finite and it varies from individual to individual you think they'll follow that yeah yeah you see, see, what, see what i'm saying so it's not like it's not like you know we have a hundred individuals and they're all genetically identi identical like the the degree of inter individual response is i mean you only have to look at something as simple as testosterone you give this much testosterone to this man mm -hmm. and you give this much of the same drug to another man and the degree of inter individual genetic response is profound different yeah. right it's just wildly different you know i i've seen people and this is what part of the argument when inexperienced people say he can't be using that amount of drug it's just not possible they just don't understand elite genetics mm -hmm. so, there are people out there that respond in profound ways to a thousand milligrams a week. It's like, wow. Like Big Rami, I think Chad Nichols spoke about this. He's like in the, in his like peak, peak where he called it the panic mode. He's like, he, they, did their, his, they did his full blood test and they did his weekly check-ins of uh, fasted blood glucose level and fasted blood pressure. Everything was just on point. Like Rami is genetically gifted in that. The, in that the, the challenging thing is that's that's our observation within our cohort, but that is also supportable in clinical evidence. Mm. You won't, you only have to look at the dose response studies of normal people to see how profound the differences are. I see. Yeah. So when you start stacking the evidence on top of each other, the, the, this idea that there are genetic outliers that just have a hyper response outcomes is that's just how it works. Mm. And anyone that cannot get their head around that, that just simply excludes them from the evidence-based discussion. They don't understand that's what the evidence suggests, that there right. are indeed genetic outliers. Now, right. what I would argue is this, this game is a game of genetic outliers, just like the NBA is. In the NBA, there are 450 players. These players are drawn from around the world globally. They are the best of the best. And even within that group, there are 50 freaks. Mm. Yeah. So what applies to those individuals doesn't necessarily apply to Citizen Joe. And this is, again, one of the great problems that we face is much of bro law, what, much of what we teach people is passed down from the experiences of the elite. And very often, that's just not true. Yeah. I've worked with, I've had the great pleasure of working with individuals. I'm just honest with you. It doesn't matter what they do. They just grow. <laughs> like, it's almost like it doesn't matter how badly you messed up. You cannot get in the way of their progress. It's almost physically impossible to impede tissue growth. I've also worked with people that are just, they're just, like, I would argue anyone in the world could put 50 pounds of tissue on their frame. Mm. 
it's it's hard to argue that you can't yeah but there are some individuals that it's a hundred <laughs> but true. that's not everybody yeah not everybody true that's that's a smaller number and here comes the challenge so the recommendations that i would place on the elite individual are going to be different to citizen joe we almost need to have two rooms where the dialogues and the discussion are different rooms and this is part of the black models i suggest we have two rooms and ex- and, and it, maybe i can explain how it works if that's possible yeah uh, but just before how it works how do you determine who is let's let's speak bodybuilding how do you determine first who is genetically that, freak that, and then that's bu- that's built into the models yeah, yeah. so l- yeah. let me explain what i would argue is this and that is you get as far as you can get naturally. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to you know, have done 100 natural bodybuilding shows, but I would argue if you seriously want to be a player, you should do a couple of shows as a natural, mm-hmm. even if it's nothing more than building the experience of how hard it is to drag your ass on the stage as a natural. It's brutal. You're in, you will respect the process just by going through that learning curve. Yeah. So start training at 15, like I did, and you guys probably did too. I think that's fair, right? You know, we show an interest young. 15, I'm killed. You know, in your late 19, 20, 21, do a couple of natural shows, yeah? And then you will learn a tremendous amount about training and nutrition and supplementation through that process. Right. What I would argue is you don't have any business opening Pandora's box into drugs until you feel that you can defend your training strategy to me. And here's the problem is I know guys waist deep in drugs that don't know anything about food. Mm. Yeah. That's the norm. So what I would argue the natural progression is when you have exhausted your learning curve on training, supplementation, dry, uh, sorry, training and supplementation, when you've done a couple of natural shows, now we start with drugs. And what I want you to do is I want to expose you to every single drug that you will see in your career in the first two or three years. So you learn how you respond to these drugs and you learn how they work before you escalate risk. Mm. In other words, we, we, we pull out the chessboard and we set up the pieces on the chessboard before we start playing the game. So you realistically get from as far as you can get as a natural and the two to three years of exposure to every compound there is, growth hormone, insulin, all of them, so you learn, and then you go, I'm ready to play the game. Now, what okay. I would argue is everybody should probably then push on from that point for two years, and at the end of that process, if you don't look like a contender, you don't have what it takes. Okay. <laughs> so in other words, you get to the point where you have not exposed yourself to risk right and you can say do i have what it takes to play the game or not that's five percent of individuals those the other 95 percent, you simply say look i don't have what it takes so what i need to ask now is what is sustainable for the next 30 years of my life so i can be the best version of myself and i can enjoy the enhanced life and i can do all those sorts of things and you've never exposed yourself to what I would say serious risk profile. Mm. And this is, but this is not how we play the game. We have guys at what I would consider to be toxic levels of androgens in year one. Yeah. That's how we play the game. So this is one of the things the black models introduced was a logical, rational lifetime framework model. You do this, then you do this, then you do this. And if you get to that point and you say to me, I want to push on and I look at you go, dude, you should push on, right? <laughs> then what you need to do is no longer work, focus 100% of your time on bodybuilding, right. yeah? Through whatever means necessary, sponsorship or whatever, you're in, hopefully you've built a passive income in the intervening years to the point where you can, you've built a social media profile and, and you have an income attached. And I want you to just put your head down for five years and, 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 and we will manage the risk because it's remarkable how much stress the human body can take on as long as you contain the discussion to a couple of years. Mm. Yeah. The problem is, as I said, we, what we do is we waste exposure years before we even know what we're doing. If I said to you, you have 30 years of moderate risk and five years of your doctor's going to tell you stop, I think that's fair. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So don't waste those five years. You place them strategically at the point where you know exactly what you're doing and you don't have any answers left. This idea that there are, you know, people seeking a pro card and they're still watching this podcast is outrageous. You should already know what you're doing. Why are you watching us? Go and eat. Do you understand what I mean? Like, like it's like learning to start a business. You write a business plan and you make your opening gambit. But by the time that you are a player, why are you watching a business podcast? You should be working on your business. Working on your business itself, right? We just don't have anything like a logical strategy about how we approach this game. The black models are the first lifetime evidence-based lifetime exposure framework that begins as a natural, introduces first exposure, introduces basal use, teaches you all about the drugs. Then we push on for a couple of years. We look at, you know, how are you doing, right? And then you make a determination about whether or not you even walk through that door or not. 95% of people will never walk through that door. That's... Uh... That's an honest thing, I mean, to say. Just be reasonable to yourself. Right. You're not going to make the NBA. I don't care. <laughs> You're in, if you've been playing amateur basketball for five years and the scouts are not watching you, you don't have what it takes. Mm. You're in? Just like Phil Heath, right? He started doing basketball. The, the thing that people don't understand is I, I made a post on Instagram. I don't know whether you saw it. I showed you some pictures of 19-year-old legends. Yeah, we saw that. Right, yeah. we saw that. Yeah. Where, where you agreed with Prodrick. Like, you're looking at the game. How is it possible that someone can look like that at 19? This is a game of the genetically elite. You you had uh, you had Broderick Chavez on your show the other day. Do you mind if I address a couple of things that he said? Because I, I thought they were fascinating. He, he, he laid out what he believed to be in order his priorities of what matters. Can I address that? Yeah. yeah. I, I think that he's very close, but he's missing one thing. The most important thing is your willingness to set everything else aside, right? And to become a bodybuilder. Yeah. The problem is that if you don't have the genetics yeah. alongside that, you can have all the willpower in the world, but if you don't have the genetics, you'll never make it. Well, the reason I say that is, there's lots of genetically talented people that just won't put the work in. Mm. This is a 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year for 10 years discussion. Right, true. And it takes a certain mind to do that. And it's not everybody and it's not every genetically potential individual. It's a certain guy. So the, I would argue the most important factor is, do you want to play the game? Because you have to understand most bodybuilders are broke. Most <laughs> bodybuilders don't have careers. They have terrible interpersonal relationships. True. <laughs> it's often an argument of the most boring man wins. You're going to spend the next 10 years of your life feeling either overfed or starving. It's not a fun game unless you're a particular type of person. I take great pride in the fact that I've done 40 bodybuilding shows. We have conversations going now, like people are looking to use things like semaglutide to reduce hunger cravings. Are you serious? That's part of the badge of honor. I'm not saying it doesn't work. What I'm saying is when I see someone on the stage and I know that they've suffered, I, I give them respect, man. Like to get in that shape is respect. The idea that people are seeking drugs that provide no therapeutic benefit beyond one thing, and that is, you know, as hunger, you know, creating less, you know, suffering. Mm. That's the point, my friend. Yeah. I can do what you can't do. I am mentally tougher than you. I can tough it out when you can't. That's a badge of honor. Why are we giving that up? Like, that's what makes bodybuilders special. I can suffer when my next door neighbor will fold. Mm. Like, how is it possible that we're allowing that ethics into our, into our competitive community? We're going to get to the point with DNP and with Synthol and with these, you know, appetite suppressants that... You didn't suffer like the guy suffered before. True. 
it's 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 part of the suffering. Now I understand there's a role for this class of drugs, and it's called the clinically obese. In the clinically obese, where they desperately need to lose a hundred pounds for longevity, and they simply cannot control themselves, this is a clinical indication for that drug. I have no right. problems with that, right? Mm -hmm. But the idea that competitors, where the where the competition, I mean, I don't know whether you agree with me or not, but natural bodybuilding is a dieting contest. It is a dieting contest, right? Yeah. And now you're cheating. <laughs> You mean you, na, that's what natural as, as someone that trained as a, a natural bodybuilder for 20 years, that's what it is. It's a dieting contest and you're cheating. You mean unless everybody, you know, this is the argument about the enhance when people say, well, it's cheating to use enhance. No, because there are federations that allow for enhanced practice and there are federations that are natural. If you're using drugs, you should not be competing in natural federations. That's unethical. Right. If you're using appetite suppressants and the man on your left is not cheating, you're cheating. Cheating, yeah. So, you know, you could say, well, I'm allowed to do it. I don't have a problem with that, but sometimes it comes down to the spirit of something. Right. Yeah, that's and I don't think that DNP is in the spirit of what we do. It's just not mm. in the spirit of it. I don't think that synthol is in the spirit of it. There's a time and a place for synthol. It's the guy that has a, a bicep that's half an inch smaller on the left than the right. And what you're trying to do is create symmetry. Mm. But even then, like it's, but then, then it's a cosmetic. Even thing, then, it's kind of questionable. You know what I'm saying? Like you go, okay, hang on a sec. Like that's just the point. This is supposed to be a competition it's a human dog show yeah you mean so these are the questions that i ask people now i understand by you know i have this reputation of being extremely you know aggravating to people but i know that by saying you know synthol and dmp you know you understand that there are people out there that are angry at me saying that right but i don't care that's what i think and i think that as someone that's done 40 shows, as someone that's competed as a natural, that I have the right to, to these opinions and people can say, I don't agree because we're not talking about evidence-based education. Now we're into opinion and we need to separate the two things. Right, true. Mm. Opinions everybody has the Everybody has the right to an opinion. This is why I got into a huge debate with Dr. Mike Isertel a while ago. He said that, you know, famously said that Dorian Yates would be a better bodybuilder if he did more volume. He's entitled to that opinion. Right, but there's no evidence to support that. Right, true. That's his opinion. That's just his opinion. Right. You cannot walk around saying that when you're a PhD because you're misrepresenting the current state of knowledge. Mm. You have to make it very clear. You can say, "Look, you know, there's no evidence to support it." But he literally went on record and debated me that there was evidence to support that. That there just isn't. <laughs> Making stuff up. Okay, let's let's talk about some more drug stuff. So I I know, I know you. Yeah. Let, let's let's talk about drugs. What would you guys like to know? Going back to when you said uh, there is like a, I wouldn't say I wouldn't call it a guideline, but uh, how do you determine the the base of any use of any anabolics? Let's say yes, you do you do follow up the um, the case studies built on that drug, but then like as as product does in his sport hrt or sport crt where he sees the clinical dosage of testosterone on a on a normal clinic uh trt clinic and then just doubles that just in order to to enter that super physiological state uh would you do the same when it comes down to primo masterone anovar and other application of uh of drugs I, it depends if you're trying to create an educational frame an educational framework for four million people you have to there's, there's, there's no other way than to make a generalization. But what I would argue is what, what evidence actually allows us to do is to create a defendable starting point for the recommendation. And then what you need to do is you need to execute that and observe what happens in every individual and then adjust for into individual response. And this is the role of coaches. So where great coaches work is they understand the framework and then they, they say, we start here because the evidence says, yeah, and then we titrate for effect and we observe the outcome based on your genetic response. Mm. Yeah. So yes, but that's a framework for 4 million. I see. So one of the one of my lines is I disagree. I don't, I don't, I disagree with the premise of like sports TRT. What I would argue is this, and that is 
you start at the therapeutic dose of testosterone. It doesn't really matter whether you want to argue that's 150 milligrams or 200 milligrams. And then you slowly titrate the testosterone until you reach the threshold of what you can tolerate as a genetically unique individual. That's right. going to vary from man to man. Love the use of anti- for, for one man, he's going to tap out at 250. The next guy is going to need 450. But the only way you ascertain that is you follow evidence-based practice, which literally says you start at less than full therapeutic effect Mm. and gradually in small increments, you titrate forward, feeling your way forward, trying to balance a compromise between full therapeutic benefit and side effect profile. This is the only evidence-based statement that can possibly be. Right. Because that's how pharmacology works. Mm-hmm. A lot of the things, and I, I really don't want to get into Broderick. The reason I actually have a world of respect for Broderick, it's, it's people misunderstand this completely. He's the one true competitor that I have. Why? Why? Because he has the experience. Mm-hmm. He has 30 years of experience. I mm-hmm. think that Broderick and I should be collaborating in many ways. I would like to hear us on a podcast where you ask us questions and get different opinions from both of us so people can hear both sides. Mm, I'd love to. <laughs> That's never going to happen. Yeah. Trust me, I'll make it. He won't show up. If, it, if, it's, a, if it's a business industry, then I'll, then I'll put money on the table. <laughs> <laughs> will not turn up. If he ever turns up, if you could ever get an environment where Brodick will agree to say, yeah, okay, cool, I'll, I'll hear Victor out, he'll hear me out. Dude, I tell me I'm there. That is the best possible outcome for this tribe. Then I'm getting for me and all the dungeon members free black uh, model masterclass. <laughs> what you need is three or four <laughs> people on a panel and you need the opportunity to ask these four experts what they think and you need to allow for intelligent dialogue between them but you must understand (laughs) that there has to be a framework and the framework has to be i need to i need to be able to ask broader what evidence are you basing that statement on it cannot be trust me i'm an expert it Mm. cannot be that that doesn't fly in the scientific or physician world yeah, it's not evidence-based in this case. If everybody keeps saying that, my experience, right? Victor, going back to the... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, sorry, go ahead. I offer you that. You guys have got a relationship with Brodick. Set it up. I've, I think it's- <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully. Uh, v- Victor, going back to when you said determining uh, someone is genetically gifted uh, in the career of bodybuilding, is there a methodology where we can test how many androgen receptors someone has? Like, we can, like, sh- shortcut everything? There's no such thing, yeah? I mean, in theory, there is, but testing needs to be practical and cost-effective. Right. During, so you you understand there are there have been studies where they do biopsies, where they look at... Because you understand androgen receptor density varies across the body. Yeah? So effectively, you would need to take a biopsy from each muscle and then study the individual muscle. This is not a blood test. This is a biopsy test. No. Yeah, that's an expensive and painful procedure. It is, yeah. That's not practical. Not cost effective at all. It's not. It's not cost effective. So, so yeah. for example, if you looked at something like pathology, what a lot of people don't understand about pathology is it's not accurate in any way. Pathology yeah. is designed to be rapid throughput. You get the answers two hours later, right? And relatively inexpensive, but not in any way can you look at that number and say that number is is meaningful. It's eh, you're in, eh, somewhere in there. So then, what you do is like if someone showed potential, you know, if if I talk about you know kidney stress, for example, if someone showed potential kidney stress, there's a logical set of steps that you go through. But the ultimate point is we would then lean into imaging, right? Because blood work is an indirect marker of kidney stress, as it is in most things. It's indirect. It's not terribly insightful or accurate at all, as is lipid skewing profile. You know, the next step up is we look at imaging. So the, to answer your question, in theory, it's possible, but it's not practical. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, uh, Victor, I got some questions regarding the thing we talked just now, regarding the different compounds. Let's say, first of all, we start with somebody with a test. And then, just like you said, then depends what speaks to you from the DHT der- derivative, right? Either primobolan, 
Mastodon or Anavar. So I always lean toward using one compound and just see how it goes. And that's the, but that's the black model. So what happens is right. you start off with testosterone, you elevate the testosterone dose to establish your genetic tolerance for testosterone. Right. That, that genetic tolerance is determined by the metabolites, DHT and estrogen. You could decide that based on a number on a page or biofeedback. Mm. You can say, so I want to stop. And then, then what I'm want... trying to say, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, so from that point forward, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping over there. So from that point forward, I would say, and now we walk in a DHT derivative. Right. And, and we put it in play for three months. Right. And then we walk it out and walk another one in for three months. Mm -hmm. And then we walk it out and we walk it another one in. And you literally go through the four choices. Nandolo, I understand Nandolo is not DHT, but it needs to be in there as well. Right. So Anavar, Masteron, Prima Bowl, and Nandolone, if it's mm -hmm. a three-month block of each, that's 12 months. Right. Yeah. At the end of 12 months, you've also put on 15 pounds of newly acquired skeletal tissue that was not possible as a natural. Right. And and then, and, and anyone that thinks that 15 pounds of tissue was basically very difficult to describe stress, mm -hmm. it's disingenuous to say no stress, but... I mean, the goal of first exposure is, is, is to establish how you tolerate these drugs and how you respond to them. So you've had now 12 months of exposure. But at the end of the 12 months, what I'm interested in is what did you think? Mm. And I'm telling you, nine times out of 10, people will have preferences. Right. Different, def definitely. And it's only when you work with a large enough body of individuals right. that you actually start to understand if that preference is widely distributed to the point of like if 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 over the years people had said masteron doesn't fit their needs i would have removed it years ago some people it speaks to the people it speaks to for the most part tend to be more interested in power building hmm. right so in my experience these are the four drugs and, and this is just a general observation right older men that are more beaten up tend to lean into Nandrolo. Definitely, because of the joints, right? Correct. Guys that are struggling with recovery tend to lean into Anavar. Mm -hmm. right? Guys that need some volumizing, you know, they, they have that need genetically, lean into Prima Bolin. Right. And guys that like to get under the bar lean into Masteron. This is just an observation. Right. If I ever got to the point whereby I ran a, a thousand people through this and nobody let into Mastron, I would have removed it years ago. Mm -hmm. There's a certain individual that it speaks to. I happen to be that guy. I like to train really hard. Yeah. I train high intensity. Yeah. That's my preferred training methodology. Guys that prefer to lean into higher volume training, in my experience, tend to lean into Prima Bolin or Nandrolo. Mm. So, Victor, so what are you suggesting? Yeah, what I'm trying to say, what are you suggesting is that trying testosterone as much as you could, as much as you could tolerate, I would say, and then every, and then every three months you would change one of the four compounds you just mentioned, right? Like adding primobolin, and then next three months, you stop primobolin, then you start introducing masteron. You, you, you take out the primobolin and you, and you exchange it for masteron, understanding there needs to be an allowance for the washout period. What do you mean by that? Like, like the uh, half-life. Oh, I see. Like if you're using your know, primobolin and nantate, for example, you would have to allow the first 20 days, it's, eh, maybe, I, maybe I can't judge too, too much in the first 20 days because I've got half master and half prima bowler running through my right. system. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 You even have to be careful when you understand the half-life means that the total serum levels of these drugs, as, as masteron's going down and you introduce prima bowler, initially you have more, more total anabolic load than you might think. Mm. Do you understand the premise of that there? Right. Mm -hmm. So you just need to be, oh, it's, it's common sense. Like, you know, I don't need to shove 200 milligrams in on day one. I'll tie, uh, as one is titrating down, I'll titrate the other one in. Now, you then also just need to be practical. Go like, this is not hard science. It's, it's part art, part science. You need to have right. a little, you know, latitude of thinking here. But most people in that process will go, no, I get what you're saying is at some point you need to speak to personal experience here. 
Mm. So Victor, just, I mean, the thing is, usually like an escalation model, let's say you go to start let's say you, your maximum testosterone is 300 and you can't tolerate anymore. Then you introduce, let's say, a DHT derivative, master on premium ball on Anavar, or maybe like one of the 19 nors, let's say MPP, or, um, or nandrolone, let's say in the off season, for example. And then within the first three months, do you keep escalating the doses? No. I, I, I explained to you, the, many of my opinions have been formed by the fact that I trained as a natural for 20 years. Right. Yeah. Anyone that says that, you know, you need to keep escalating, going like, dude, like you've never trained as a natural. If mm -hmm. you're walking around with 500 milligrams of androgens in play, for the mm -hmm. first year, you're growing. Right. You just don't need more than that for a year. I have no problem with the discussion about escalation over your career. Mm. Right. But I'm telling you, if you're training hard and eating right and managing stress and understand sleep hygiene, 500 mm. milligrams of androgens a week for the first year is grow, 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 grow. Mm. All you need to do, people don't understand this. It's like, I would argue it's, it's the one secret of bodybuilding. Like there's, there are no secrets beyond this one, right? All you really technically need to do here is understand that. And, and this is a, understand I'm a bro. I'm not a PhD. I'm not an academic. I'm not a doctor. So sometimes I use analogies because they, people can visualize it. Yeah. Mm. All we need to do is to create an environment where, Muscle protein synthesis mm. exceeds muscle protein breakdown rates by some margin and hold it there and hold it there for three years. Mm. Now, the bigger you get, the more challenging that becomes, yeah. right? But you don't need to have the, the delta massive. It needs to just be grams of protein tissue a day, relentlessly, relentlessly. Relent this is why I've never understood the blast cruise mentality. How bigger difference do you need mm. if you're a natural and you've learned to grow as a natural then adding androgens and growth hormone and insulin things like this will ensure that your muscle protein synthesis rates exceed your muscle protein rates by some margin for at least the first two years without too much effort and too much stress the problem is just like being a natural i'm sure you understand that everybody understands this the first year as a natural, you tend to grow like a weed once you understand what you're doing. But the second year, it's not so much. Yeah. And the third year, it's less again. And after about five years, you get to the point where you're just not growing anymore. Mm. You, you understand the premise I'm saying? Like, I would argue this. Most naturals, the first year, they don't know what they're doing and they get frustrated. And then eventually, they figure stuff out and they start growing. It took mm. me about two years to figure out what, what, what I was doing, right? So I count day one as... By the time you have a half semblance idea of what you're supposed to be doing, that's day one. From that point forward, I'm telling you, year one is probably going to be a 12 pound year. Right. Right. Well, year two is probably eight pounds. Year three is probably four mm -hmm. pounds. You know, like there's a diminishing return as a natural. Right. And you get to the point whereby, like, you might put a one pound in a year. Right. Now, I would argue not taking those gains, you're in starting drugs while you're still picking up those gains doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. yeah? But I would, I, would say you should, I would also argue you shouldn't do what I did, and that's wait 20 years. My one regret is I waited so long, but I was so <clears throat> adamant that I wanted to I, – I overcooked the natural thing. You, you know what I'm saying by that? Yeah. I probably should have started about year six. Mm. Yeah, because I would have gotten to the point whereby after year six, the, the return I was getting was almost the effort versus the return wasn't, it's very hard to justify the effort I was putting in. Yeah. And then what happened was you start the drugs and you fundamentally press that reset button and you have another 12 pound year. Oh, wow. Yes, exactly. True. Yeah, and yeah. then surprise, surprise, you have an eight pound year and then you have a four pound year. And then what we get is we get down to diminishing returns. But if you add the total tonnage, the, sorry, the total pounds up, you're going, hang on a sec, that's 35 pounds. You, you understand? It's possible to acquire 35 pounds of tissue with almost no stress on the body if you do it that way. Okay. And what I would argue is if you have the right frame and you put 35 pounds of quality tissue on that frame, 
you will look like a bodybuilder, right? Now you probably need another 15 pounds and we need to talk about that. And that's what I would call, that's when we need to go into growth phase. But the first 35 pounds, they pretty much hand them to you on a paper plate. Mm. And then, and then the, the last 15 pounds, we have, to, we have to raise our risk profile to some degree to achieve right. it. And that's what I'm saying, like give yourself two years. Now, if you don't look like a contender 50 pounds in, I would argue it's very difficult to justify going to a high risk model. Okay. Mm. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's, it's, but people are blasting. I'm going, why are you blasting if you understood how to train and you understood how protein synthesis versus muscle protein works and simply the art of holding them at imbalance for a constant three years, you will acquire those gains without ever having undertaken practices that your doctor would tell you you need to stop. And this is the entire premise of the blast cruise model makes no sense. People are blasting in year one when I'm telling you, you just don't need to. Like, it's very hard to argue that you need to blast androgens in year one to put on 12 pounds of tissue. Come and let me train you for a year. I will give you 12 pounds of tissue in year one with a very defensible model. Where I run out is I'm telling you, but that doesn't go on forever. You are absolutely going to get to a point where we need to raise the dose. That's not negotiable, right? right? But it's not in year one and it's not even in year two. Why not in year two? Because if we spend the first year experiencing these drugs and making decisions about what we're going to use in the future, then plausibly year two is where we start to introduce growth hormone and insulin and other growth promotion agents. So you get at least two years Mm. of walking all the various classes of compounds in. And if you do it right, there's no reason that that ratio between tissue breakdown and tissue accretion cannot be held apart. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's very hard to argue that you can't hold those two things apart. It's like taking a natural bodybuilder. There's a guy called Jared Feather. Do you know who Jared is? Yeah. Used to be natural. Particularly impressive individual from his physique point of view. He has just a nice physique. Yeah. The fact that he got that far as a natural, I would argue that you could probably put 20, 25 pounds of quality tissue on his frame with a very moderate amount of stimulatory input. Mm. Yeah. But eventually, inevitably, he's going to get to the point where we need to start escalating the dose. The doses, right. So, but not in the first two years. Victor, the big talk, the one we talked about before the starting the podcast, DHP and Boldenone. <laughs> yeah. What would you like to ask? Let's, let's ask the question. Um, just like a general question, what do you think about like Boldenone or maybe even DHP? They keep saying it is... I mean, stronger than test. I don't know, stronger maybe. For but, but here's, the, here's the challenge. It always goes back to this concept of evidence-based. You said on that podcast, yeah, that the reason that you were interested in bold known was that it potentially was more anabolic than testosterone and potentially it provided a pathway to elevate one somatocrit. Right. Remember that, that, that scenario? Yeah. yeah. I didn't say that. I was asking. <laughs> yeah. But my, 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 my argument would be here in, the, in this understand the evidence here. You have to understand that all androgens, by their mechanism of action, elevate hematocrit. True. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I should want that one. So when these drugs were used in human clinical practice for that intended application. They didn't use bold known. The drug that they ultimately settled on from the, for the most part was anadrol. Mm. Anadrol's indication is for anemia. Yeah. yeah. But they trialed Haler tested and they trialed, you know, they trialed Prima Bola and they trialed all sorts of drugs. But what I would argue is this. So, so this is a class effect. It's a class effect of androgens. They ra- it raises hematocrit levels. Right. There's absolutely no hard evidence that bold known does it more profoundly than any other androgen, mm-hmm. right? It's a class effect. Yeah. And so my question is, well, why did you choose bold known? Because there's reputation that the drug 
does it more profoundly than other drugs, which is fine. I understand that. But my question is, but what evidence is that based on? Because I would argue no one's ever done a, a study that would hold up to peer review that would support that. It's plausibly that is true. I don't have any problem with it. Maybe that's true. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between maybe that's true and it's an evidence-based recommendation. I would argue, on the other hand, is, well, we know that the number one people that men are removed from testosterone replacement therapy is elevated like hematocrit. Well, we'll just, we'll just use testosterone, right? Like if, if, if TRT can do it, yeah. why cannot as much testosterone as you could tolerate also fulfill that role? You're suggesting a secondary compound for a mechanism of action that is not evidence-based. Right. This is what I'm saying, actually, because the number one reason to stop TRT is high hematocrit. So why add another compound, which, which may increase your hematocrit when, when you don't need it? But this is also the argument. The argument is, well, you won't see the outcome for 90 days. I'm sorry to inform you that's simply not true. What happens <laughs> is this. There is no silo or storage facility for hematocrit where you take a drug and it dumps it into bloodstream. It doesn't work that way. Right. Red blood cells need to be, for, for want of a better word, manufactured. Right. It's not the correct word, but we don't understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. and, and so we know from, there's very strong evidence that says this, that happens on day one. You inject the drugs and, and hematocrit starts to build. And, and it builds from day one. And by the time you get to about 30 days, you've got, more than half of the total elevation of the matter is in play. But yes, it's fair to say that it builds slowly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't, it's not like day two, it's woof there. That's not realistic. It's also not accurate to say nothing happens for 90 days. Right. It, the logic here is, well, hang on a sec. You add the drug and it starts to elevate. Mm -hmm. So if you had an individual that said to me, okay, so this individual has done pathology and he has low hematocrit reading and we desire to raise that, I would argue any androgen will do the job for you. Sure. So you should choose the most benign one. Mm. That's the logic here. Why, why would you use Anadrol? Why would you use Halotestin? You could, but it's a very difficult argument to make that Anadrol is the right choice simply right. because of its known toxicity profile. And this is the problem with bold known. I consider bold known to be a direct head-to-head -head competitor with testosterone. It's an androstate, right. right? So the reason I'm not a fan of Dianabol or bold known, I don't believe either of them have a place in responsible drug use. They go in the bin. And the reason they go in the bin is if you hold Dianabol and testosterone up side by side, I would say this is a realistic competitor. You, it's either or. Mm -hmm. Why would you choose Dianabol? It's liver toxic. It aromatizes into methyl estrogen, not estrogen. Yeah. Right. I don't know whether you saw my Facebook page. A gentleman said it's plausible that it doesn't aromatize. Fascinating conversation. But let's just assume what we know says it aromatizes into methyl estrogen. And it's plausibly one of the most neurotoxic drugs that we have based on the relatively limited data we have today. Testosterone, on the other hand, it's the, it's the bioidentical hormone, for want of a better word, if we can use that term. That might not be technically correct because of the way it's synthesized, but that, that's irrelevant. And it's the most benign compound that we have at our disposal. So let's lean into, when, we, when we're considering which compound will we use, the logical rational choice is to lean into the most benign compound that will do the job. Right. And in this case, it's testosterone. Testosterone. The, the, the argument that you would put bold known into play because it's more anabolic than testosterone, I would like to see the evidence that supports that. There is none, right? Now, if someone wanted to make the observational argument that that's true, what I would say is, no, that's personal choice. Mm -hmm. There's no credible evidence that that's universally true for all men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's a drug that, it's very difficult. Why, why would you use bold known? Like, again, the, the use case that says we're selecting bold known because it's more anabolic and we're selecting bold known because it raises hematocrit. I'm going, that's pretty hard to argue in evidence. What I would suggest you might do is just, just stick with the approved for human use drugs yeah. and, and, and choose the most benign one. Why use Anadrol for that application? It makes no sense. Even though Anadrol was clinically indicated for that application. It doesn't mean it doesn't work, but you're raising risk profile for no, no defensible reason. Right. I mean, just like you said, like choose the safest drug through the job.
most of the time. I mean, all the time. That's, this is this is why I like talking to doctors because any doctor will say that's just, that's just how the game works. Right. We we have choices. These drugs work, but this is the most benign choice, and I would prefer that you lent into that unless you can make a use case for why you don't want to. And this is the argument. If anyone can make a use case for the use of Dianabol or Diva, go for it. But most people make choices, quote, unquote, because. That's their, that's their use case, because. And that's difficult to defend in evidence. True. Uh, Victor, going back to the one thing that you've been really, really promoting, uh, which one of his job dropping him out. Oh, sorry. Are you, are, can you can you speak up? I didn't hear you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm saying going 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 to one of the topics that you've been really promoting it and pointing your fingers on that we did not really know about for the past like uh, I don't know five six years of training, which is uh, a therapeutic pill. The Tilmasartan, I was going to talk about the yeah. receptor two <laughs> blocker. So, uh, I've I've faced, uh, as I've seen a lot of your episodes, I've never heard you talking about any side effects of Tilmasartan more than you're talking about the therapeutic side of it. However, we I've experienced through my coaching um, uh, experience, some of my athletes on a on a regular Tilmasartan dose of forty mg go through a. Uh, kind of an arrhythmia, uh, a fluctuation in electrolytes. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, due to being uniquely built different or other factors playing a role in that. Or is it really the Tilmasartan that is, is is doing that or maybe I should titrate the, the dosage down or up. I, I just wanted to know because even electrolytes through uh, blood work doesn't really tell you if it's right or wrong, because because uh, electrolytes are some in the bones and right. stuff. Right. I think I, I think Abdullah is trying to say that tilmisartan raises your potassium, which is like maybe in the future like a recipe for arrhythmia. Okay. Here's the challenge: any drug has to be considered to have a side effect profile. It's right. disingenuous to say there's drugs with no side effects. Yeah. True. But the challenge for us is. There's a difference between a risk profile, for example, like if we look at something like testosterone, I'm going to come back and answer your question. I, I will come back. If you look at a lot of the case studies that might argue against the application of something as simple as testosterone replacement therapy, the problem isn't the application in a healthy young man. The problem is the application in someone that has pre-existing condition. Yeah? So if you have someone that's already suffering chronic prostate inflammation, it's completely fair to say that the application of androgens may exacerbate that situation. Sure. Yeah? But there's no evidence that in healthy young men that yeah. these androgens cause benign prostate hyperplasia. That evidence does not exist. So yeah. there's this problem in case studies that say, if you have individuals that have pre-existing conditions and we introduce this medication, we see this outcome. This is very fair. So someone with pre-existing renal stress that introduces a drug like telemosartan runs at a risk of potassium overload. Let's just call it that high potassium levels. This is well documented, but it's in people with pre-existing renal stress. It's not in healthy individuals. Yeah. Now the, the challenge that we run into here is we, every recommendation that I make, the assumption that I'm making is that it's someone following the black models that doesn't have pre-existing health problems. I see, healthy individual. Okay. When you have bodybuilders, you have to understand renal stress is probably the most common existing condition in this community. Yeah. It's, not, it's at the top of the list. Yeah, I would argue for 30 years, people have been telling us the ills that plague us. There's nothing new in what plagues us. Lipid skewing, inflammation, oxidative stress, we know very well what plagues us. You know? Renal stress is right at the top of that list. Right. Yeah. So if you take someone that's not following the black models, is it reasonable to assume that they may well have a pre-existing renal stress condition? I think you should go into that conversation expecting that. And then they don't listen to the black models. They just heard along the great one that telemosartan happens to be the latest thing. And they introduce telemosartan and suddenly they have a potential. Yeah, well, that doesn't surprise me at all because they haven't listened to the models. You know, what I'm suggesting is if you start 
first exposure and you never introduce renal stress to a healthy individual, defending the idea of elevating potassium is incredibly difficult to do because it is because of the renal stress that that outcome occurs. Mm. So that makes sense. Yeah? yeah. So this is the complexity of someone with pre-existing chronic prostate inflammation and you introduce androgens and you see an outcome. Sure. Someone with pre-existing renal stress that introduces a drug like telemosartan and, and, and suddenly finds themselves battling, you know, a, 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 a potassium elevation and you're surprised by what, but you're not following the black models. You're sure. half assing it, you know, and, 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 and taking these things that you heard and putting into play without fully understanding the conversation in its entirety. Mm -hmm. uh, so Victor, the thing, don't you think that other variables would affect it? Like for example, somebody like on high potassium diet and in the same time, let's say somebody who's like, was in 40 milligram of telmusarin, he was doing fine. And then we bumped it up to 80 milligram telmusarin. And then we found that his potassium level has been, I mean, increased. What was his potassium level? I mean, one of them was like 5.9, I think. Okay, that's very high. You, you understand like that's, that's a very high level, yeah? So what I would say is what the clinical data suggests at this point in time, there's absolutely a point where the alarm bells goes off and you go like, you know, that's, that's plausibly an issue, right. yeah? the general recommendation would be, but that's most likely an individual that has some pre-existing renal issue. And in that individual, you need to carefully monitor them. Yeah. And then, you know, when you see that, you know, that five more, because people need to understand the risk is, go, okay, so what's the risk? Going over five plausibly elevates the risk of a cardiovascular event. Okay. Yeah. But then the risk of a cardiovascular event depends on the individual. You have to understand that clinical data is derived from individuals with pre-existing health conditions. Mm. Someone that has renal stress probably likely has some underlying elevated risk of cardiovascular adverse outcome. Mm. Yeah. So that doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're at over five that, oh my God, I'm freaking out. So this is the problem. What I'm saying is if you take a healthy athlete that has no pre-existing cardiovascular concerns, right? Doesn't have, you know, arterial plaque deposits of any kind, doesn't have any, you know, left ventricular hypertrophy that's concerned, doesn't have any, you know, red flags, let's just call them that. And then you introduce a drug like telemosartan, you can't connect the dots. Like, it's like, you have to put the pieces in play. You're in, it's a conversation. It's a valid conversation. The, the pushback I have on these things is this. We're a tribe of people that walk around waist deep in toxicity, like waist deep in it. Like, you know, we're slamming 3,000 milligrams of androgens a week and as much growth hormone as we can afford and 100 units of insulin. The risk profile of telemosartan, when you balance it against the risk reward that's on table, the things that brings to the table versus the risk, it's very hard to argue that we shouldn't be having that robust conversation. But what I would argue is, I'm addressing my audience, not, not people listening off to the side. If you listen to what I say very carefully, you shouldn't have that risk profile to begin with. And this is, you understand the complexity of the conversation. Yeah. I'm addressing a very specific audience here that are mindful of these issues that are not, you know, like if someone said to me, says, look, you know, I'm using three grams a week of androgens and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. I would be saying, you know what, like, you, you need to see yourself as a high-risk individual and, and the approach you take needs to be, uh, I'm going to put this in play and I'm going to evaluate the consequence and adjust based on what I see as a genetically unique individual. It's not a default discussion for that man. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think True. We're, running, we're kind of running out of time. But um, you want to add anything else? No, the, the thing is, Victor, just one thing before to wrap it up. It's only regarding the uh, uh, nandrolone. I mean, we know it has some sort of like cardio, maybe even neurotoxicity. But the thing is, if it is the one that speaks to me, can I use it for a longer time? I mean, risk I, is I, a fire. I don't, I don't know that I would fully support the, the first statement. And the reason I say that is you, ha you have to appreciate that there's more studies done on nandrolone than any other anabolic steroid. You understand technically testosterone is not an anabolic steroid, technically. Yeah. Nandrolone very often 
acts as a stand-in for anabolic steroids. Mm. Yeah. So what the authors of these studies often are implying is that we are selecting androgen to represent all anabolic steroids and the consequence of use of all anabolic steroids. And so if you go through the data and you're not careful, you'll find a lot of cautionary tales about nandrolone, but the cautionary tale is about steroids, not about nandrolone. Mm. Does it make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, this is the part of the problem is people will you know, uh, attach a risk profile to the drug. And I'm going, I'm not sure that you're reading that study correctly. The, the takeaway from that study is androgens, anabolic steroids, not nandrolone. Mm. Yeah. Now there are some very specific studies and this is where the, 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 the complexity gets into, but what I would argue is the greatest risk to cardiovascular. So let, let me, let me back up a little bit. If I look at the risk profile of these drugs, what I would basically say is 90 nor derivatives, right? You must understand they're also steroidal progestins. Right. Okay. The problem with steroidal progestins for the most part are related to cognitive impact. Yes. And the more potent that the steroidal progestin is, the greater the potential impact. Right. Yeah. So what I would basically say is a small amount of nandrolone it's very hard to argue what the problem is, mm. yeah? But I wouldn't be using it in large dosages, and I'm not really too concerned about the cardiovascular risk profile because I interpret that to say that risk profile is really more a statement about anabolic steroids in general, general. Right. yeah? And I would be more directing the conversation to say, please understand that the risk of 19 or derivatives is the risk of steroidal pro you know, progestins. And for the most part, that doesn't elevate our risk in renal health. It doesn't elevate our risk in liver health. It doesn't elevate our risk in cardiovascular health for the most part. But it does plausibly raise questions around brain health. Brain health, right. Like, Victor, what is the, I would say, Almost huh? <laughs> that's the only question regarding the same uh, nandrolone. What do you consider it like a small dose? I mean, a reasonable yeah, fetch, dose. Fetch, us. So, so I don't know whether you're familiar with the premise of what's called the black basal models. Yeah. The yes. black basal models are really designed for 95% of people interested in the application of performance enhancing drugs. And they know they're never going to be contenders. Right. They have a profession, they love training, da da da. And what I would argue is typically, if we're talking about a healthy young man with no pre-existing health conditions, understanding I'm addressing 4 million people, right? I would argue that what you should do is probably walk up to about 500 milligrams a week. And I know that sounds like a relatively small dose, right? But most guys can tolerate 500 milligrams a week of androgens of the more benign choices. And nandrolone is one of those okay. relatively well for, for decades at a time. Okay. And, and we even anecdotally know this because 400 a week was the blaster, like the cruise dose. People would scale back to 500, you, you know what I'm saying? So there's all these lines of evidence you could put on the table to say, look, as, as a general rule of thumb, most people, most of the time, assuming they're healthy men, can tolerate 500 milligrams a week. Now, how you want to divide that up, 300 tests and 200 nandrolone or 250, 250, whatever, that's personal choice. Right, yeah. But if you put that into play, what I would argue is Nandlo doesn't represent a greater or lesser threat to your health than a DHT derivative does. Oh, really? Okay. Simply because it's a relatively moderate amount. Okay. Yeah. Now, I wouldn't be leaning to a thousand milligrams a week of a 90 nor as a growth promoter. I think that there are better ways to escalate the dose than 90 mm. nors, mm. unless. Unless you're an individual that says, look, I accept the risk. Because at the end of the day, I'm no one's mother. Yeah. And if someone says to me, look, I'm into the play this game, I, I, I would step back and say, by all means. But if someone said to me, what's the most benign profile that you can put on the table? I would argue it's as much testosterone as you could tolerate without okay. DHT blocking with an out and AI, mm -hmm. and then walking a DHT derivative. Yeah. And, you know, let's escalate that dose up to the point whereby you take in as much androgens as you can tolerate. That, that would be my, my, my first line of preference. When okay. we push on, 
-hmm. we push on with DHT derivatives. Okay. Yeah? And the final step that goes on top of that is at some point, if you want to introduce a 19 nor, I would be leaning into the argument for some trembolone. Mm. Because it is, it's, it's the most potent of the 19 nor derivatives in some regards, but the potency doesn't come from its relationship with the antigen receptor. It comes from its, its potency as a steroidal progestin. Yes. So if we're going to lean into a steroidal progestin, if we can make the use case for a steroidal progestin, why would we not lean into the more potent of the two choices? Okay. Yeah. The challenge I would put on the table is what most people need to understand, though, is the argument for Trembolone always becomes, look, just throwing it against the antigen receptor as a ligand to bind with the antigen receptor, cause gene transcription and creep protein. It's a poor argument. Any of these drugs will do that. Right. Where you would deploy Trembolone is strategically when you can make the argument for non-classical genomic signaling or when you can make the argument for against the, the, the glucocorticosteroid receptor or, or against the progesterone receptor because you're trying to elicit this outcome, then I would be honestly leaning into a moderate amount of Trembolone. And in this case, a moderate amount means... We start at the historical clinical human dose, which was 50 milligrams a week, okay. and we titrate for inter-individual tolerance. Mm. Most people start to have cognitive impact as you escalate the dose. Their sleep hygiene suffers. They're, they start to have aggression problems. Mm. Now, most people can tolerate a little bit very well, but I think it's a defensible statement to make observationally as you escalate the dose, we start to see cognitive problems. Mm. Okay. Like we spent like more than two hours now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I would like to stay the whole day. <laughs> I, I keep talking all day. We can split that into part one and part two, by the way. Um, can I can I can I make a suggestion here, guys? Yeah. I have a thousand more things to say. Maybe at some point in the future we can come back and and, just, and talk about these things. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Would love to actually. This is your platform, Victor. Whenever you want to jump in, just let us any time that you guys want. I, I mean, I, but we could talk for three days. So we'll, we'll just you know, maybe call it there for today, and we'll, we'll pick it up. And by the way, Victor, uh, is there by any chance we can get you here? Sorry, is there by any chance we can fly you from Thailand to Dubai and like? Give oh, I would love to come. I would love to come. To oh, thank you. Because I think really? I, yeah. I sent you an email once. I, I don't know if that's your email or not, but I didn't get any replies. So if you can just I'll be honest, I get, I get so much spam. Like literally oh, I all, see, all I get all day, every day is yeah. guys asking for free help. Yeah. Oh, and my, my spam filters are on pretty tight. I, a lot of people complain it's difficult to get in touch with me. I'm just very transparent, very honest. Yeah. I get about 150 emails a day and they're all asking for free help. <laughs> you understand? It's just, so the only way that you can deal with it is unfortunately some of it gets caught in the trap. You're in like it's just how it just how it works. So let so me talk about that. In 2019, I went to Kuwait. Yeah. Oh. I thought it was fabulous. I, I haven't been to the Middle East before. I thought it was absolutely fabulous. I would love to come to Dubai. So absolutely, if the invitation is there, done, I think done, that would be great. Done. What what I what I might suggest we do if it's possible is let's do do a couple of these shows because then I think people would get to know me a little bit better. No, okay. trust me, the, the people who I have in my gym definitely know you because we keep repeating your name a lot. And 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 even when even when I said podcast, a lot of people came up and like, Abdullah, don't you think of getting him here in Dubai? Uh, for me, for me, it's a, it's an easy thing to do. It's just a matter of negotiation and see what's what's easier for you and we can make it happen whenever you want. That, that you know, that would be lovely. Late, later this year, at some point, that would be awesome. Would definitely, you do that? Definitely. Be that was very enjoyable, guys. I, I appreciate you. it. Thank you, Victor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, brother. Thank, thank you, you, Victor. You appreciate it. So <laughs> <to> come, guys. <laughs> <laughs> take care.